And welcome to our regular Wednesday conversation on the work of anti-racism in our churches and communities, PTS response. This week, we extend a special welcome to our United Methodist friends who have joined with us. Last week, I had the pleasure of speaking with Kurt Cussero, Bishop of the Southwest Pennsylvania Synod of the um, ELCA, and Reverend Melissa Stoller, Director for Evangelical Mission and Assistant to the Bishop for New Renewing and Collaborative Ministries. Bishop Cussero has been newly appointed to the Board of Directors here at PTS. Our conversation was wide ranging, naming the challenges of anti-racism work in what has been called, quote, the whitest denomination in the US, and the efforts over the last 10 years to address racism and white supremacy in the church. The conversation took a decidedly personal turn with the Lutherans as we remembered the mass murder of congregants at Bible study five years ago, the Emmanuel 8 at Mother Emmanuel AME Church in Charleston, South Carolina. What was the Lutheran stake in this horror? The pastor, Reverend Clementa Pinckney, had been educated at a Lutheran seminary. And the murderer, Dylan Roof, had grown up in the Lutheran church. And there we have the deep paradox of what it means to be church, a place where community happens, where the liberating word of the gospel is preached, and prophetic leadership is nurtured, while also harboring and sometimes even nourishing habits, practices, beliefs, and postures that are anathema to the gospel. Those of us who belong to the church have been called yet again to name that fatal contradiction and to do the hard work to move us closer to beloved community. Today we continue our conversations with regional judicatory leaders and I'm delighted to have in our virtual room today Bishop Cynthia Moore-Kokoy of the Western PA Synod of the United Methodist Church and Reverend, Reverend Deborah Mason, Interim Coordinator of Diversity Development Inclusion and Inclusion for our conference. Prior to her 2016 election as Bishop of this conference, Bishop Moore Kakoy served churches in Baltimore and Annapolis, was a dis district superintendent and then superintendent for the church in the greater DC area. And during the unrest following the murder of Freddie Gray at the hands of Baltimore police in 2015, she provided key leadership for the church's pastoral response to the community. Prior to her call to ministry, she was a school psychologist for a number of years, something I've asked her about in terms of its uh, applicability to her work today. Recently, she helped to spearhead the United Methodist Church's recent initiative, Dismantling Racism, which we'll be discussing today in our conversation. The Reverend Deborah Mason, recently appointed to the role of Interim Coordinator of Diversity Development and Inclusion for the conference, comes to this work with broad experience in business, nonprofit, and diversity inclusion work in both corporate and higher education settings. We're delighted that she anticipates completing her MDiv at PTS in 2021. In her work for the conference, she will help the conference live more fully into the goal of dismantling racism through training events that raise awareness of things like implicit bias and the increase of cultural competencies. And she'll work with individuals in local church and conference committees to highlight the importance of diversity in fulfilling the mission of the churches, as well as liaising with and supporting ethnic clergy. Welcome to both of you. I'm delighted to have you folks here today. Um, I often begin these conversations with some insight into how your personal stories help to provide context for understanding the work that you're doing now. So Bishop, I'd like to turn to you first um, to start off. You grew up in the Methodist Church. Um, I recall reading a story uh, about how your eyes are open to the church's participa participation in racist structures and oppression. Um, when you were younger, you asked why your family stayed in a church that didn't fully welcome you. Could you please tell us a little bit about that story? Yeah, yeah. So on both sides of my family, my mom's side and my dad's side, um, we go back as Methodists for generations. Um, so both of my grandparents on both sides were members of the Methodist Church in 1939 when it chose to segregate itself in order to placate members of the Methodist Church South who could not envision themselves uh, being in, in worship or being in structures with Black folks. Um, and so I grew up with that. Um, 
kind of in the, the background asking stories about that. And, and I remember m my dad in particular, I'm um, talking about how my dad um, was a United Methodist pastor. And I remember him talking in particular about how some of his clergy friends, black clergy friends, kept inviting him to, to go to the AME church, the African Methodist Episcopal church, um, where they thought that they might find um, greater equality. And, and my dad always told them each time they asked, no, no, because his view was that if we're going to have a hope for the kingdom of God, um, we, we need to be in relationship with one another. And, you know, while there are, are structures um, and, and systems in place that, that keep us apart, um, there are some things inherently about the dream, the goal, the ideal, the, the perfection in love of the United Methodist Church that could potentially provide for equality for all. Um, and so I, I believe that, that my grandparents and great grandparents believed in that dream. I, I think that they were holding out that, that one day we all will get together um, in this beloved denomination and be treated equally and, and thought of equally. And, and, and because of the structure of the United Methodist Church, we have the opportunity for that ideal, even though we have not yet lived into it. So it sounds like there is more than just a social conviction behind that decision to stay. It was informed by a deep theology as well. Oh, absolutely, absolutely. Uh, a theology that, you know, as we, we um, talk about a lot in, in United Methodist circles, that we are moving on to perfection. That we are, we are, we experience God's grace, glimpses at a time and moments of complete love for one another and complete connection with God. We have glimpses of that, um, visions, foretastes of glory divine. Um, but but we still have to work towards it and and we don't want anything to impede the work of the holy spirit and how we might cooperate with that um as as we do that work so we're, we're trying to dismantle the structures so that we can continue to work with god's cooperating perfecting spirit um as we get to where we need to be that's a great way of thinking about the work of dismantling these structures, that it's about taking away the barriers that keep the spirit from doing its work. Exactly. exactly. Yeah. Um, Reverend Mason, I'd like to turn to you um, and tell a little bit of the story about, um, in, in contrast to, to the bishop's multi-generational Methodist background, you only relatively recently became a United Methodist. Can you tell us a little bit about that journey? That is correct. Uh, when I first uh, was called into the ministry, I was Baptist at the time and uh, became an ordained Baptist minister. But when I was called into the ministry, it was very clear to me that I was called to pastor. And I know that's a unique calling, but I felt it truly in my spirit. And in my pathway, in my journey, it was becoming more and more difficult to become a pastor in uh, the Baptist church for various reasons. Um, uh, women are, are, there are women uh, pa uh, Baptist pastors now, and, uh, but there have been some difficulties along the way. So I just went into prayer. I mean, it was, it, this was a, a very clear road for me. I went into prayer and started doing research. And of course, I don't have time in this setting to give you all the details of what I went through, but certainly my steps were ordered and God placed people right in my pathway to send me the message of where to go. And uh, ironic, one of the things I did in my research was go on various websites. I looked at the Presbyterian faith and looked at United Methodist. And when I looked at United Methodist, I really liked what I saw on the various websites. And so in addition to the other things, the messages that the Lord placed in my path, I decided to uh, become United Methodist. And at the time, didn't realize that I would not get uh, credit for my work as an ordained Baptist preacher, that I had to start all over again. But I know it was God was in it because I didn't, um, didn't miss a beat. I was willing to do that. And I haven't looked back. It's been a wonderful experience for me. 
Let's turn a little bit now to, to the work of the United Methodist Church. Um, so uh, back in 2015, during the social unrest, Bishop, um, you, I mentioned you were um, instrumental in helping organize the church's pastoral response to the unrest following the murder of Freddie Gray. Um, tell us a little bit about the work that you did there and, and what you learned from it, what it meant for you, because I'm, I'm suspecting that there's a connection between that and your leadership as a bishop and the moves that you've made to help the, the national church address issues of racism. One of the things um, that, I, that I learned was the gift of the connection in the United Methodist Church. Um, we happened to have six United Methodist churches in and around the Sandtown community, which is the neighborhood um, in which Freddie Gray grew up and um, where, where the, the first steps of the murder happened. Um, and so we were able to connect those churches in order to respond to the needs of the community. And each one of the churches had a unique passion that um, was able to, to, they were able to lend their gifts and their passion so that we were able to holistically meet the needs of the community. So, so one of the churches, um, their, their passion was to, to be giving food um, and to be give, give, getting medicines and pharmaceutical items to the community. And so by golly, that's what they focused on. Another one of the churches was more into social justice. And so they um, organized the, the Association of Black um, Lawyers in, in the Baltimore area to come and to actually give training to some of the Black Lives Matter folks, some of the young adults in the community about how they should interact with the police, about how they should go about doing nonviolent protests. Um, they were able to equip them with what, what you say and what you do if you do get arrested. Um, we had a, a, another church that, that uh, wanted to try to organize volunteers to come so that we could meet the needs of the school children because schools were closed in the community during that time. Um, and so volunteers came to, to do activities with the young people. Um, and so I, I learned the importance of connection and the fact that God gives each one of us unique gifts. None of us have a hallmark on all that is needed. And in order for the issues to be addressed, we need each one of us to play our unique role in, in doing this work. Um, and so um, it, it was a wonderful learning experience um, where that is, is involved. Also, I don't want to leave this out. One of the churches had a unique connection with the police department. So we actually worked on how we might strengthen our relationship with the police department. So we invited them to come to one of the churches and, and do a training and have conversation with clergy and with, with lay leadership. Um, we also arranged for some of the clergy and lay leaders to do ride-alongs with the police so that they could have a better understanding of, of what a police officer goes through in, in their daily lives. So uh, another learning was that you, you should not villainize any group of people. That's just as bad as the racism that we're trying to combat. Um, there's good and bad in, in everybody and in every organization. And it's our responsibility to, to, to give folks the benefit of the, of the doubt and to reach out to the good that is in them. Um, it seems that the work that you did with the community as well was a, a great, um, example of living out this conviction you have that if God's going to call you, God's going to equip you. I know that's something that you've said in the past and you've written it frequently. Um, but this idea of this sort of ecosystem of these churches identifying the unique gifts they have and recognizing that they don't have to provide the whole solution, but they need to be working in concert with other communities to provide a coordinated response that includes all of the, the members of the community. That, that's absolutely true because one of the realities of, of all of those churches is that they were all churches that were struggling. You know, you know the story, big buildings in an urban center and, and few and older members. So they all were struggling, all did not believe um, or, or were struggling with the belief that they had something to lend to the community. Yeah. Um, and so, yeah, that was also part of the story. We don't have to have it all and God uses and equips um, us for that moment where God needs us. 
We're starting to get some comments in our chat pod. I'd like to remind those folks who are listening in that um, they can use the chat pod or the Q&A pod to pose questions or comments. Um, one of our participants has said, thank you, Bishop, for showing us the body of Christ and its diversity, how it can respond to na the nation's original sin of racism at multiple levels. Only the church can work si simultaneously and with integrity with both Black Lives Matter and the police. Let's turn towards this new initiative, um, Dismantling Racism. I'm going to do a screen share right now um, that will uh, show folks the website and the press release. Um, Bishop, you were instrumental in um, uh, organizing this, this particular initiative. I'd like you to talk a little bit about it. Well, I, I, again, I think God puts people um, in the places where, where God needs us. Um, we just um, elected a a new president of the Council of Bishops for the United Methodist Church, Bishop Harvey. Um, and she, um, I think, would describe herself as a radical. I would describe her as a radical, um, as, as someone who has bold leadership. Um, and so when she saw what was happening around the country in response to George Floyd's murder, she said, we need to do something. And so she reached out to some leaders um, in the church. Um, she reached out to the General Commission on Religion and Race, which I um, now have the privilege of being the president of, and to, to other agencies in the church and said, we must do something. And so we decided that we would, again, capitalize on our connection. Mm -hmm. Rather than working on these matters in silos, you know, having the Council of Bishops work on something, having the Commission on Religion and Race work on something, having Church and Society work on something, having United Methodist Women work on something. Rather than working on them in silos, we would come together mm -hmm. and figure out what, what we must do and can do together. And so we've got this joint approach, approach an approach that will include liturgical acts, like mm -hmm. acts of worship, um, we, we did an act of lament. Um, we uh, uh, have planned future events like that, liturgical acts. Um, also providing platforms for information, for knowledge, mm -hmm. and for conversation. Um, and then on some, some education, uh, putting together some Bible studies, putting together some book studies. Um, that are more narrowly folks focused on particular populations. So, mm -hmm. you know, some white folks get together and, and study what it is to, to, to be immersed in a sy system of white privilege. Um, mm -hmm. Some black folks getting together as a minority in a predominantly white denomination, how can we mobilize and encourage ourselves? So there'll be some particular uh, cohorts also that we're working together, but we, we're, we're putting all these things together and mm -hmm. taking deliberate action, holding ourselves accountable so that mm -hmm. this time will be different. We're figuring out how we can push resources out into local churches and into local communities so people can figure out how to do political action, how, to, how do you speak to a congregation that still is, is trying to decide whether or not racism really exists in the mm -hmm. world and in the church. We're trying to push resources out to a variety of levels of people so that they will be on ramps for a number of people. Um, I'll, I'm going to ask Lori, who's working, uh, pulling the levers behind the scene to uh, put in the chat pod the uh, web links to the two resources that I just shared, the end racism resource and the press release that has a number of useful links in it. Um, one of the things that struck me about your description of what the initiative involves is tailoring resources to the various diverse contexts. So you'll have resources that, you, that are unique for all white churches, for uh, mixed congregations, for all black churches, understanding that different communities have different points of entry into the shared work. Um, Deborah, uh, Reverend Mason, I'd like you to um, bring this a little bit closer to home. Um, we talked in our uh, pre preparatory conversation about your particular passions. There are some real challenges to doing this work here, particularly in Western PA. Um, can you tell us a little bit about, um, especially because this is this is a role that you've taken on specifically as interim coordinator in this conference, where do you see the challenges? Um, well, we have a couple of challenges. One is that um, 
we have white Christians who are racist. And uh, that has been uh, in the news, in fact, lately. I've just read an article about that recently. And so that is the uh, crux of who we're dealing with with Christians. And it's really an oxymoron that we have Christians who uh, uh, are not enlightened enough to know that uh, that they are racist or have racist attitudes. So that's gonna be challenging. And because of that, it's hard to bring up the subject of race. When you're in denial, oh, and there's the article right there. Yep. Uh, when you're in denial, uh, it's difficult to have these conversations if you uh, don't want to admit these things. In addition to that, it's very difficult to even bring up the subject of race uh, to many white folks. They uh, dodge the subject and feel uncomfortable in talking about that. So that's gonna be some of my challenge. In addition to that, in the past, I have found that a lot of African Americans will tend to want to make white folks feel comfortable, even when they've been offended. And my counsel has been to them, stop doing that. Um, mm -hmm. If you've been offended, you need to let people know that what was said or done or thought has hurt your feelings and has blocked your uh, pathway to success. And so we need to be more vocal about that. You've been made to feel uncomfortable. They should be made to feel how uncomfortable that is. So then from that point, then maybe we can, can, we can now have an open and honest conversation and move forward. So to um, initiate, them, go ahead, I'm sorry. I was just going to say, um, I'd like Lori to put into the chat pod the link to the um, NBC News article written by Robert Jones. Um, and I'd like to commend the work of Robert Jones and the Public Religion Research Institute to folks who are interested in finding out more about this. Um, they are in the business of researching the very things that Reverend Mason is talking about right now. And it's a result of their research using the indices they have shows a higher prevalence of racism among white Christians than other populations. Um, yeah. This website, uh, Dr. Jones received the Grahmeyer Award for his book on the presence of white supremacy in the church. Um, so just to, to commend um, those resources to folks and uh, underscore what Reverend Mason's talking about. So it appears that some of what you're talking about is what um, has been talked about as white fragility, this idea that some yeah. Um, the, the work of, of non-whites is to uh, help whites feel more comfortable about their attitudes, their, their um, brokenness, their participation in racist structures. Would that be a, a correct observation? Absolutely. And, and to combat some of this, what our program staff has done here locally, we have set up a pledge. It's called the Now Action Anti-Racism Pledge. If you go to WPAUMC.org, right on the front uh, page of our website, you can click on and read about our pledge and pledge and sign up. You don't have to be United Methodist to sign up. Um, and once you sign up, what will happen is every month, you will get an email from us suggesting educational and action thing activities you can engage in to move yourself along and to have a better understanding of how, uh, how racism works and some of the attitudes that we need to uh, dismantle here and, and, and with what's been going on as far as uh, ensuring that we now have racial justice. So I, I would encourage everyone to go to our local website and uh, take a look at that pledge. So that would be on the Western PA Conference's homepage. The pledge would be right there. Excellent. Yes. Um, during our preparatory conversation, Bishop, uh, one of the things you talked about um, was the Klan. And this, you know, seems to hark to some anti-nostalgic 1950s, but this is a recent phenomenon. Yes, this the is a recent phenomenon. I apologize for my dog. <laughs> Who's barking? <laughs> <laughs> Having two of them myself, you don't need to apologize. <laughs> he wants some attention. Um, so I, I want to share with you um, the fact that, uh, oh, sorry, the fact that um, when I, when it was announced that I was going to be sent here to Western Pennsylvania Annual Conference before I even arrived, I got a letter from someone who um, said that it was better for me to stay where I was. Because here in Western Pennsylvania, um, there was a certain order to things. 
and they actually went through the appointment process that we go through as United Methodist and said that white men get the best appointments and that, that I was to make sure that that would continue to happen. And that if I didn't make sure that that was gonna to continue to happen, that in Western Pennsylvania, um, folks believe in carrying guns and when they shoot, they shoot to kill. Mm -hmm. um, fortunately, I, had a, I have a friend who um, is a, works for the US Department uh, of Justice and she actually litigates hate crimes. And so she was able to get me in touch with someone in the FBI who came and, and read the letter and said, this is a clear example of a white supremacist who was trying to intimidate you. Now this white supremacist had intimate knowledge of how we do things in WP in Western Pennsylvania. And so it either was a pastor or someone who was high in lay leadership in our annual conference. So this isn't something that is out there. It is something that is right here. And um, we know um, because some of our clergy in the Western Pennsylvania Annual Conference have been approached that the Ku Klux Klan is still trying to recruit United Methodist pastors today to be a part of their movement. So what is it that we as United Methodists are giving off that the KKK thinks that there's fertile ground in Western Pennsylvania um, for our clergy to be recruited by them? That's happening now. This isn't something that's out there or down south. It is right here in Western Pennsylvania, in the church and in the United Methodist Church. What are your thoughts about um, the reason why this is so? I, I'm, as you're, you're telling this, this story, which is shocking but not surprising um, for Western Pennsylvania, um, I'm thinking about the conversation with Bishop Cussero and Reverend Stoller last week as they spoke with deep pain and lament the fact that um, Dylan Roof had grown up in the Lutheran Church. What are your thoughts about that? Yeah, so um, there, when you, you, you read that article, um, that we just posted, there is a lot um, that we need to reckon with about the history of oppression and Christianity in this country um, and how Christianity has been advanced um, in, in many circles on the, the backs of black and brown people and systems of oppression. Unfortunately, it has Christianity has grown up together with racism in this country. So it, it is in our DNA, so to speak. Um, and one of the difficult things is when something is in your DNA, you don't even realize it's there. It, it's the, it's the, the, the old construct of when you, as a fish, when you swim in water, you don't know you're wet. Um, and so that, that's part of our reality. It's, it, it, it's grown up with us. It's, it's in our DNA, it's, it's the water that we swim in. Um, and there's something about church culture that people tend to be nice and don't wanna confront these issues. Um, you know, Deborah talked about how African Americans in the church, one of the things we're drawn to is to help to make other people feel comfortable. And so we're reluctant to speak up when things are offensive, even in, in our own church. Um, and to me, that's a disservice to our brothers and sisters because we don't allow them to grow and then we can't grow if we're not being honest about how behavior is impacting us. Um, it, allows, it allows all of us to live below our Christian witness if we don't unearth and, and speak about, speak up about issues that offend us. If, if we're if we're afraid that someone might leave the church, if we make them feel uncomfortable uh, about their white privilege, um, mm -hmm. if, if, we are, if we, if we want to say Christians don't talk like that or, or um, don't confront people like that, um, then we're living below our Christian witness because certainly Jesus confronted some folks 
on their stuff. And occasionally made people mad too. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> um, this is this is a fascinating conversation because as you are um, as you're talking about this, I, I'm thinking about how. Um, your background as a psychologist seems to have been some of the best pre-professional training for being a bishop committed to these issues that, that you could have possibly had. Because as I'm hearing you describe things, there's deep theological conviction there. But there's also deep understanding of, of how real people operate and mm -hmm. the, the conditions they need in order to grow and flourish in the way they are called to. Yeah, that, you know, again, God equips us. God <laughs> equips us for what we're called to do. Yeah. <laughs> it just, it, God just affirms that over and, and over again. Um, and, and, you know, we as United Methodists, we believe in using science mm -hmm. to inform our theology yeah. and how we go about bringing social holiness throughout the, the land. We, we believe in using that. Social holiness. I, that's Social the, holiness. Yeah. I love that. Um, we do have a question that's just come in, and this would be for both of you. Uh, why is it so difficult for the white church to confess its racist words and behaviors and its complicity with systemic racism? Is our problem theological or merely sociological? Well, I, I'll start in real quick, and, and I'll let the bishop uh, close it out. Um, I, I think it's definitely theological. Uh, the Bible, we, the two greatest commandments is that we love the Lord God with all our heart and our soul and our mind and to love our neighbor as ourselves. So how, and also how can you say you love God when you look at your brother and you don't love your brother who you see, but you say you love God who you cannot see. Those are our are, are theological, our doctrines, our principles in the church. And so how can you say you're a Christian you know, I think we're fooling ourselves uh, when we say we're Christians, but we don't want to sit down and try to understand one another and talk to one another and give respect to one another. When we have these preconceived notions of what it is to be an African American and not understand what it means to be white in America, when we don't want to sit down and talk to one another, you are fooling yourselves because that's not at all what our Lord and Savior intended for us. That was a whole point of God going to the cross to die for us, to draw our attention to him and his ways. And he uh, redeemed us. And so for us to go about business as usual is uh, and not uh, going in the right direction. So I would definitely say that we are fooling ourselves into thinking that we have a grasp on being a good Christian, that we're falling way short. Um, and, and I would say that it's both and, and I say both and because I believe that all good psychological and sociological principles can be found in the Bible. Because after all, God is the creator of, of us all. Mm -hmm. And so God created us as human beings, behaving human beings. God created us to be in community and organization together. Um, and so Theology and sociology and psychology are all intertwined because they all come from the creator. So it's, it's, it's both and. Um, I think that um, unfortunately we have, we have allowed our human nature to inform who we say God is. Mm -hmm. And so um, we have, um, for example, to, to make it plain, we, we know that early in, in, in um, slavery in this country, Christians used the Bible to support Christianity. So all of the sociological constructs around slavery, they said were theological because God had ordained Africans to be slaves and had ordained Europeans to be master over them um, and that theologically the slaves needed to obey their masters so we have we have unfortunately conflated the two and so i think our work um, collectively as a christian community is to disentangle what we have done through human nature what we have made theological 
that is not theological. And that's really hard, hard work. Because what you're saying to someone is what you believe to, who you believe God to be and how you believe God wanted you to be in the world is not true. That's hard, hard work to do. Yes. And it, it deals with core identity issues too. Um, and, and we see what happens when people feel as though core identity elements have been threatened in some way. Um, it strikes me, and bringing up how, how the Bible has been used to justify slavery in this country, of course, um, until you know not too long ago, it was used to justify apartheid in, in South Africa. Um, and we had a conversation with one of our, our staff, Derek Woodard Lehman, who talked about uh, the Belhart Confession in the Reformed tradition and the, the reckoning the white Reformed, Dutch Reformed Church had to, to do in, in South Africa. But it strikes me that we've always had this temptation to um, craft theological principles that somehow make us comfortable instead of uncomfortable and add God language to things that we want to see perpetuated. Um, so it seems the, the reverse of, of Genesis, instead of God creating human beings in God's image and likeness, we are creating God in the image and likeness we want to project. Um, and that, Absolutely. I think the, the idea of this initiative, beginning with liturgies of um, lament and repentance, I think that, that key word lament, it's not something we do very well or easily, particularly in this country. Um, learning how to lament well is is going to be part of this work. This is a great um, entree into, I think, as, as we round the corner to home, um, I've been asking our guests to talk about, since, since this series is largely geared towards white churches and emboldening white faith leaders of white or majority white congregations to uh, to receive and enact the call to racial justice, to embolden them to do that. Um, I'd like both of you to speak into what it will take for these churches, these leaders, for us uh, to be effective allies. Um, what do we need to do? What principles and actions do we need to hold in priority? I, I think, first of all, I think we, and to build on what the both of you have said thus far, is our Christian walk and journey is not one of comfort and convenience. And we try to make it that. So we need to understand if we really truly love the Lord that we, the painful part of it is asking God to search our hearts and to correct us where we are wrong. And so a part of that, when we look at uh, race relations today and we're asking God to search our hearts, we want God to reveal to us what needs to be changed and how our steps need to be uh, better than what they are. So that's a painful experience. And, and then to avoid that pain and to avoid that inconvenience is to avoid drawing yourself closer to God. And so um, we also need our white uh, parishioners to understand that racism, I'm a victim as an African-American of racism. I'm not the, uh, I, I'm not the uh, perpetrator. And so it, we need white America to take ownership for uh, systematic racism that exists in our country and has for years. And until we can get a uh, white America to deal with that, in particular white Christians, we will never get beyond where we are. We can take baby steps, but we need to really be able to grab hold of this and make some, have some good conversations mm -hmm. and make some changes. And that's uh, with um, folks admitting that they are the perpetrators of racism. Just because you're silent, you, what you're doing is endorsing it. <laughs> and so you have to speak up. And, uh, and a good way to do it is like, take our pledge, our challenge, we'll help you with that. We'll help you uh, do the research and to look into it and see what you can do to make this world better and to draw us closer together. And uh, Deborah, thank you for that response. What I would add to that um, is that I would not want my white brothers and sisters to be paralyzed by perfection. And what I mean by that is that often what I've heard from my white brothers and sisters is that they don't want to say or do something because they're not sure if it's the right thing to say or do. Mm -hmm. um, and I want to remind us that, that we are not perfect. We are striving to be yeah. perfected in love, mm -hmm. but we're not yet there. 
So I would say experiment, try something. Um, and if it works, great. It, if it doesn't work, if it happens to offend somebody, then, then I hope that you have a relationship with, with a person of color who loves you enough to be able to say to you, that offended me, don't do that again. Mm -hmm. um, because that's how we learn. That's how we get to where we, we need to be. Um, uh, so, so don't be paralyzed because you're afraid you're going to do the wrong thing or offend somebody. Your silence is offensive. Mm -hmm. What we need you to do is to speak up, is to say something. If you see something, as John Lewis said, if you see something, say something and then do something. Okay. It might not be the first time the right thing to do or even the second time the right thing to do. But if you don't do anything, you'll never get to where you need to be and we'll never get to where we need to be. And so, and I would say to my, my black brothers and sisters, my brothers and sisters of color, let mm -hmm. folks know when they're saying something that is offensive so mm -hmm. that they can grow, so that we all can grow. Um, and, and I would say experiment even with your churches. If you're a leader in, in your church, don't be afraid. Don't be afraid to, to say something that might be offensive. Say it with love. Don't take yourself too seriously. Don't stand up and proclaim that you have the right answer. And so therefore this is it, mm -hmm. um, you know, have some humility about you. And I think people will respect that, but, but don't be afraid to push your congregations just a little bit. If there's somebody that's, that's not uncomfortable with what you're preaching every Sunday in your pulpit, then you're not preaching the gospel of Jesus Christ. It seems that there's a unique contribution that Methodist um, thought and theology can make to this too. I've asked each of our, our denominational guests to speak about the unique gift of their theological tradition to this work. And what I've heard repeatedly in our conversation today is that perfection and holiness are a process and processes require making mistakes and messing up but trusting that God is ordering the steps and um, is the one who is leading us all to the intended beloved community at the end of it. Amen. We had one question and uh, Reverend Mason, since you're a student and Bishop, since you're on the board, uh, you're both well equipped to answer this question. It is, what would our guests see as concrete ways that the seminary PTS could make could, in order to become an ally for racial justice. Hmm, that's, that's a, a good question. Um, you know, I think one of the things could be a requirement mm -hmm. for um, classwork, coursework in mm -hmm. social justice. Um, you know, what would it look like if um, every seminarian had to take uh, a cultural competency inventory mm -hmm. and that part of their matriculation would be dependent on the steps, the progress that they made towards greater intercultural competency. Mm -hmm. That could be something um, that, that the seminary could do. Um, I think the seminary could also um, continue to look into its history mm -hmm. of, of racism and racial mm -hmm. oppression Mm -hmm. And to, to talk about that um, it, it, in a way not to continue to rehearse the hurt, but to, but to accept the hurt and to hold ourselves accountable to make sure that that same hurt doesn't continue to happen mm -hmm. and that we look for ways in which now that hurt manifests itself um, in our new cultural realities. You know, there are certain things now that won't happen because of where we are as a culture, but, but racism and, and, and white privilege goes underground, right, mm -hmm. and manifests itself in different ways. And if we don't, if we don't look at where we were in the past mm -hmm. and keep that before us, those ugly tentacles will continue to, to, to raise up. You know, it's like weeds in the garden, right? If you don't get that right, it'll continue to raise up. And I would just like to add to that as a student, um, I've had only two classes where it was intentionally where racial justice or uh, our racial differences was intentionally brought up. And that was in a pastoral counsel, counseling class and an ethics class. 
Uh, however, I feel that this is a subject that should come up in every class. And so that would mean that our professors would need more training because sometimes it has come up in other classes and I could tell the professors were very uncomfortable and they couldn't get off the subject fast enough. So I think this is something that could be interjected in no matter what the, the title of the class is, where we talk about our racial differences or how that impacts the subject. But uh, what's happening now is when it does come up, and it will, um, mm -hmm. we can have our professors running from it. And so I would like to see that uh, attention paid to that. We are now at time. And I'd like to thank uh, both of you for the generous gift of your time today and your candor and participation in this conversation. Um, next week, we will continue our conversation with our own professor of urban ministry and the director of the Metro Urban Institute, Professor Drew Smith, who's going to talk about his recent research on what it takes to be an effective ally. Um, he is also part of a team that was responsible for writing and receiving a very important Loose Foundation grant to uh, unearth the impact of COVID on vulnerable and marginalized populations here in Pittsburgh. If you are interested in finding out more about the grant, um, I direct you to the homepage pts.edu where there is a press release about this. Um, Reverend Mason, Bishop Moore Kukoi, thank you so much for being with us today. It's been a pleasure and I look forward to continuing the conversation with you in the future. Thank you.